So I'm a, a research professor of interfacing law and technology at a law faculty, and I also have a chair at uh, Faculty of Science with the computer scientists. <coughs> And one of the interesting things that I find is when I uh, look at their papers or discuss things with them or the students write papers, then in the first part it always says, these are the assumptions. And then you have assumption one, two, three, four, five, or whatever. And then I say, but these are ridiculous assumptions. And then they say, so? And I say, yeah, but if, if that's ridiculous, then why do the research? And then they say, yeah, but if we don't assume that, we can't do the research, right? And I say, yeah, but what problem are you solving? So this is, um, this is part of the discussions I have with computer scientists. Um, <laughs> uh, and I think it is actually one of the main points of what I want to say today. That's why I start with it. So uh, apart from the brain teaser, on the right, which I like because it shows um, the bias of our brains. Our brains think that we have two eyes and one mouth. And the mere fact that there are four eyes and two mouths here does not change our brain's bias. So it tries to, to look at this from many angles and in many ways just to calibrate it into a normal face. But alas, it doesn't work, so you get um, a problem with your brain. So I want to talk about three types of bias. I want to talk about profile transparency, what that could mean. And then I want to talk about uh, automated decisions, which is basically uh, under the GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation, EU law from 2018. Uh, uh, an important right, I think, in relation to Machine learning. So here's another brain teaser, uh, which is another one, of course. I think this one is also very um, telling for what I'm trying to do. I think that most things you can look at from different angles, but not necessarily, like in this case, at the same time. Just try to look at this picture and capture both ways of seeing it at once. It's not possible. But it doesn't mean that one is wrong and the other one is right. Both are accurate, actually. And the brain is, is reconstructing it, putting it into context. And what I want to do is precisely this. Look at things from different angles without saying necessarily this is right and that is wrong, which absolutely does not mean that anything goes. So for me, one of the things why I love what has happened so far and what I've seen from uh, the abstracts is this um, willingness to suspend judgment and to say, hey, look at, uh, you can look at things this way, but that has these implications which we don't like. That means we maybe we should try that way, but that has so trade-offs. Mm -hmm. And I think that if computer scientists, lawyers, ethicists, politicians, and please citizens um, sit down to talk about these trade trade-offs, to put them on the table instead of under the table, we'll already be um, uh, many steps ahead. So the discussion about, uh, about um, bias, I think is very, very confused. All different types of bias are thrown on a heap. And you can, of course, categorize them in many different ways as computer scientists. <coughs> You undoubtedly know that you can categorize the same data in different ways, and that has implications. I'm doing it now in terms of three uh, different senses. The first is the type of bias that is inherent in any action perception system. Action perception system, perception system is what makes an entity an agent, an agent at a very high level of abstraction, so not necessarily human agent, not necessarily uh, a biological agent, it can also be an artificial agent, but I would say, looking at the literature, um, and, and I also can give you a lot of reasons for that, for which we don't have time, that an action perception system, so something that can act on what it perceives to be the consequences of its own actions, that that is what we call an agent. Now, that's the first type of bias, and for me that's the most important type, type because it influences all other types of bias. And the other types is what uh, I think is very important for lawyers and ethicists, 
bias that some people would qualify as unfair. The problem is that we're not going to agree about what is fair, like price discrimination. I know many people who say that it's wrong, though it's actually part of our economic system. It's existed for a long time. And of course, the way price discrimination can be done now is different. So we can talk about that, but it's not illegal or unlawful. The problem with ethics, which is also its advantage, <coughs> is that we're not going to agree. Somebody can say, you're wrong, and I'm going to hit you on the head. That happens quite often in the history of humankind. But uh, there, there is this essential moral ambivalence. And I think that's why we invented positive law. So at some point, we agree to disagree, and we say, OK, um, <coughs> this is what we can agree we're going to, is going to be enforceable. Hmm? And then we come to bias that discriminates on prohibited grounds. But first, let's talk about the inherent bias. And I think that relates to something that Bateson, one of the founding fathers of cybernetics, said that um, th this information is all about the difference that makes a difference. There are all sorts of differences that you can flesh out about anything. The point is, which is the difference that makes a difference? And to answer that question, you have to, to, uh, to ask the question, what makes a difference for this particular agent? Artificial agent, a certain animal, um, like for instance, a bat. There's a famous little book by Thomas Nagel, a philosopher, and I think the book or the article is called Seeing Like a Bat. Like, a bat doesn't see very much, actually. <laughs> if the wall is here, it doesn't see a wall, like we do. But it will not fly into the wall, because it's got other, other type of perception. So it's not seeing a wall. It's actually hearing something, which it certainly won't call a wall, because it doesn't speak English. At least not the best that I met. So an action perception system, um, because of the way that it relates and has to survive in an environment, it will be continuously profiling the differences that makes a different difference to that system. So the salience of the output of such a system of an agent depends both on that agent, and once again a bat sees different things from us, <coughs> and of course on the environment. If there is no wall, uh, it would be curious if the bat saw something <coughs> like what we call a wall. So for me, perception is a means to anticipate the consequences of our action. And in neuroscience um, and a lot of other fields, that's also how the essence of perception is traced. Why do we need to perceive things? There is even a very interesting uh, Mr. Wolpert, not David, but Daniel Wolpert, who says the reason why we develop this big wet lump of stuff here in our skull is because we started moving. And if you start moving, you really need anticipation. You really have to do processing, especially if there are others who are also moving. Now, this is all very obvious to us, <coughs> but when you're a little baby, um, and in, in that sort of unconscious phase, you have a lot to learn, not to bump into things. So perception is a means to anticipate the consequences of action. Some philosophers and neuroscientists have called that an action in a sense that action and perception is part of the same equation. If you're not ever acting, you won't perceive anything. That also means that there's, of course, no such thing as objective neutrality, because you're always seeing things in line with what you want to do, or you may want to survive. And as I said, that absolutely doesn't mean the fact there is, there is no objectivity in the naive sense does not mean that anything goes. On the contrary, it is all a matter of life and death in many, on many occasions. So profiling your environment, perception, anticipation. Um, okay. Now, machine learning is about, um, I would say, choosing and pruning relevant, correct, and sufficiently complete training sets, if you're doing it well. Developing and training the right algorithm to detect the right mathematical function, that means that machine learning is always based on a productive bias. And I would relate that 
philosophically to what Hume says. You're sort of busy inferring things. And what people like Gadamer, a continental philosopher, said that there is no perception without what he then calls a vorurteil. So there is no conception if there is not some background bias that directs you to uh, detect the difference that makes a difference. It also means that optimization always depends on context, purpose, the availability of <coughs> training and test data. And that means, and that is of course for computer scientists working on machine learning, totally obvious, if not boring, that means there are always trade-offs. The problem is that apart from machine learners, everybody else thinks that if you do machine learning, you get absolutely one, the real truth, to the solution to all the problems we ever had and will have in the world. <coughs> now, as soon as you begin to look at the trade-offs that any, any practice of machine learning involves, it becomes interesting. So the reliability depends, the reliability of whatever machine learning you are doing, depends on the extent to which the future confirms the past. Because your training set and your test set will never consist of future data because future data are not there. That's an essential feature, <coughs> to say something very silly, of future data. So this is basically what David Wolpert's no, few, uh, no free lunch theorem means. And I th think we should find ways to translate that theorem in a way that um, that people understand it and, and also can understand the implications. So Wolpert basically said, if you have a training set D and a target input-output relationship, F, that's your mathematical function, that's, that's the one that is actually at work, but that's the one we don't know. That's the one we want to uh, find out. So uh, we also have the hypothesis uh, the algorithms guess for f made in response to d. And we have, and this is of course usually the assumption that is under the table, we have c, that's the off training <coughs> set loss associated with f and h. So this is a generalization error. How well you do is determined by how aligned your learning algorithms is with the actual posterior. So um, only after you have seen um, I think Nietzsche in Die Fröhliche Wissenschaft, the, the, the gay science, I think it's called, um, says that it's easier to find causes when you already have the consequence. Basically, that's what machine learning is, the same problem that you encounter. Now, I think that there are all kinds of implications with that that are important, relevant, that make a difference. The bias that is necessary to mine the data, the bias in this case is the mathematical formula, so H, hoping to be F. That bias, I'm not talking about unfair bias or racial discrimination at all, I'm talking about the constitutive bias. The bias that is necessary to mine the data will co-determine the results. What is more obvious, but sometimes the obvious is the most important thing to realize. That relates to the fact that the data used to train an algorithm is always finite because we have time in this universe. Reality, whatever that is, let's not have metaphysical discussions about that, but reality always escapes the reduction. Data is not the same as what it refers to or to what it is a trace of. It's not. There is this and there is the data that refers to it or is a trace of it, whatever. But it's not the same. That's very important. And uh, for instance, Tom Mitchell in his, in his handbook on machine learning, I, I wanted to quote it. He said, we shall see the most current theory of machine learning rests on the crucial assumption. Here we have an assumption <coughs> that the distribution of training examples is identical to the distribution of test examples. We know that that's not true, but it's an assumption, otherwise we can't do work. And despite our need to make this assumption in order to obtain theoretical results, 
It is important to keep in mind that this assumption must often be violated in practice. So very practical. I'm not saying that machine learning is nonsense, but I'm saying this has huge implications. I'm now even going to quote one of the other abstracts. <laughs> uh, he, Michael Fahle says, he's coming later, the common assumption that future populations are not functions of past decisions is often violated in the public sector. This is exactly what I've been trying to say. So I would be very happy if this was a co common assumption. Within machine learning, it is a common assumption, but politicians have the opposite assumption, especially when they are in love with nudge theory and uh, that sort of stuff. Actually, however, I believe that present futures, um, and this, this statement is based on the work of Elena Esposito. She's an Italian uh, philosopher who wrote a book, The Future of Futures. It, she wrote it before the financial crisis of 2008, but it's about futures in the, in the technical um, financial sense. And what she shows in that book is the more scenarios you create, the more you predict, the more uncertainty you create. Why? Because everybody who can see the prediction is going to act on it. So the common assumption, to speak of common assumptions, that predictions reduce uncertainty is entirely wrong because we are human beings. If you have a prediction, you're going to change your behavior. So predictions increase both uncertainty <coughs> and, of course, possibility, because you can act. Um, now, the point is about the distribution. Who gets the uncertainty and who gets the possibility? And that, of course, depends on who gets to see the output. If somebody is... Um, trying to uh, enlarge a market share for something and does, um, uh, does some targeting online, which is, of course, what is happening all the time. Think of A-B testing, for instance. Most websites are A-B tested continuously. Um, then there is this service provider who does this kind of targeting, who sees the output, who sees the predictions, and can act on that but the user not. That's the whole idea. Hmm? So the user sort of gets the uncertainty and the, the targeter gets the possibility. Now, that relates again to something else. There is a famous uh, uh, statement of Thomas' theorem that was popularized by Thomas Merton, philosopher of science, who said if men defined it, women in that time, obviously, what, they, he sort of, they escaped his uh, perception, perception system. So he said, if men define a situation as real, it is real in its consequences. Now, he was talking about a self-fulfilling prophecy. But I think that is, that is, again, something that is constitutive for us. If we decide that if you get married, <coughs> that that means that the assets of both the man and the woman are by default put together and the creditors can get their money from the, the assets of both, <clears throat> that's not because there is a natural law or a physical law. No, that's because we believe that. Because the legislator, because we believe in the law. Right? Believe between inverted commas. Now, we're moving, I think, from a situation where that is true. It's been true ever since we use natural language. To a situation where if, if machines define a situation as real, they are real in their consequences. And I'm not saying that's a bad thing. That's not the issue here. I'm saying that this is a new situation, um, and it's important to see that. Uh, one example is, of course, the, the United States, very interesting elections in the United States they had. And um, well, what, what interested me is that it turned out that Mr. Trump had been saying for <coughs> a long time that he was not, he was a real man, so he was not into data. Hmm? But actually, after he got the nomination, he hired Cambridge Analytica, and they did analytics. And they actually, at least that's what they said, they predicted. In the meantime, uh, Clinton had ADA, which was, of course, a reference to ADA Lovelace. And 
more has been written about it. Both parties actually base their decisions where to speak, uh, what audience to seek, what to say, what to tweet, I don't know what, on these algorithms. <coughs> so, if machines define a situation as real, it's real in its consequences. It's not because these predictions were true. We will never know that because you can't turn t of time in the other direction in real life. T has a vector. So we can't, be, uh, can't do that. But this is very important because it has consequences. That means that there are always trade-offs. Machine learning involves always a training set, algorithms, and a test set. I believe also in the case of unsupervised, uh, that is a fact. I, I'm sure you've all seen these nice pictures of, I think it's the dream machine, where um, uh, a machine learning system is trained on animal faces, and then it's shown plants, and then it sees in those plants animal faces. Wow, what a surprise. So also when you do unsupervised, it's all about on what have you trained your algorithm. So trade-offs are inevitable. The choice of the training and the test set, and choice means size, relevance, accuracy, completeness. Are you going for low-hanging fruit, for cheap stuff, for data that you have lying around? Do you have time and money to cleanse them? Do you have good experts who know what cleansing means? I love the word cleanse. I'm a woman, so I'm, I do cleaning. But cleansing, that's uh, even more interesting. Um, choice of the algorithms, clustering, decision tree, deep learning, blah, blah, blah. The speed of the output. Are we talking about real time? Do you want to train a system like a car? Are you going for total accuracy? Well, everybody will be long dead by the time you reach your conclusions. So, but there are trade-offs, of course. <coughs> <coughs> and uh, this all relates to accuracy of predictions, outlier detections. Now that means, for instance, there is a famous book written by um, some people who are both not computer scientists, I believe, uh, where they, it's, it's called the big data revolution. And the whole book is built on one assumption, and that is N is all. And when I saw that, I was so surprised, because it's total humbug, and I'm sure um, I work with data scientists. There is no data scientist who actually believes that. But this book has influenced policymakers because policymakers tell me if you have enough data, all the error just goes out. So we really, purpose binding, we must do away with it because we need all the data. So I, I believe this is actually a dangerous book. Oh, then I'm. <laughs> thank you, because then I'm happy that you asked. Otherwise, you would think I'm insulting somebody. No, this is Maya Schoenberg and Cook here. Okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah. And I, I respect both of them. I think they're excellent scholars. They've written excellent work. Cook uh, here writes fantastic pieces in the Economist. But here, they're totally wrong. And it's dangerous because. This is the sort of books politicians read. Okay, um, something else, and actually this, I saw that um, the person who was speaking later would actually speak on the zebra. It, I, I really loved this piece. Uh, we're actually encountering a new catch-22. So suppose that experts train algorithms on relevant data sets. They keep on testing the output. It's not just a one time off, but they keep on testing it, they do reinforcement learning, until the system does very well, and we have the, if you've read the extract, or you will listen to it later, a wonderful example with ZEB, the medical uh, advice system. But this also goes for student paper grading, uh, legal intelligence as it's now uh, emerging. <laughs> At some point, like if you, if you train Watson Ross, what's, uh, Ross is the, the legal intelligent uh, stuff that's built on Watson, whatever Watson is. Um, uh, what if big firms are sending their top 0.02 lawyers to Ross, to train Ross? I think it's already happening. Hmm? And they, they do that for two years. So the firms say to, to IBM, 
you, you can have my lawyers for two years. After that, I want uh, an unlimited license or whatever. Hmm? Now, after two years, these lawyers might get totally bored, totally and completely bored, because the system does well, because they've done good training. Hmm? This is the expertise of the lawyers that is now in the system. So they get bored and they do other things because, you know. Then you get what, uh, what is described in the, in the paper, the ZEP paper, as semiotic desensitization. So, you know, they are going to do other things. So they, they, they will de skill. There is a book by Nicholas Carr, I think his latest book, two years ago. I think it's, the title is um, The Glass Cage, where, where he says what we see now is humans are de skilling. These expert systems that have been trained by these humans, they're getting better and better. Humans do other things, and here comes, of course, the catch-22. These systems will then start building on each other's output. Think of legal, legal intelligence. Hmm? They will start building on each other's output. You have a totally new dynamic. And then the question is, who can test whether the system is still doing well two years later? What is doing well here? Who gets to determine what it means to do well? A machine? A human being? Another machine? So if you're talking replacement, it might be high risk, high gain. So replacing experts, decision makers, at some level by machines. It might be high risk, high gain in terms of functionality. Um, and fairness and our ability to cognize our own environment. And it's that last thing that interests me. So, um, if our cognition is basically mediated increasingly by these systems, <coughs> and we actually cannot check back what these systems are doing, because we got bored and went and did other things, then what does that mean? Okay, one example uh, on automated prediction of judgment, the legal intelligence, which is now popping up everywhere. Um, I'm going to now say why I think automated uh, prediction of judgment might be interesting and how it might be used in a way that is good for lawyers and for law and especially for those that are subject to the law. So it can be used as a means to provide feedback to lawyers, but also to the clients, to prosecutors and to courts. It could involve a sensitivity analysis, where you modulate facts, legal precepts, and claims in your system to see what it comes out with. It gives you an entirely new view of your legal system. That means you're basically using it as a domain of experimentation developing new insights and maybe even developing new argumentation patterns that you didn't see earlier. Because of the sensitivity analysis, you can test alternative approaches. You could also detect missing information, facts, legal arguments, and help to improve instead of merely predict the outcome of cases. And of course, in that sense, it can be used to improve the acuity of human judgment. But that doesn't work if you replace it. Now, I'm sure it is already being uh, in, uh, replaced, like in public administration, a lot of decisions on social security taxation <coughs> are taken by these kind of systems, though I don't think it's machine learning, it's still uh, decision tree uh, stuff. But I can see all taxation offices are experiment, experimenting with machine learning and social uh, security fraud. So my opinion is, if you have to, or if you find that it's feasible or effective or responsible to replace human judgment at a certain level by these machines, OK, but don't call it law. Call it public administration. OK, now, very quickly, bias as um, unfairness, hmm? bias that some would qualify as unfair. This is a matter of ethics. As I said, we, in terms of ethics, we don't agree. That's, that's the beauty of ethics. 
And we have different goals, but we also will disagree about the means. Do you think that we could nudge citizens into compliance or should we tell citizens what we expect of them so that they can contest that? Can we do it behind their back or not? There's obvious ethical disagreement about that. Um, if we talk ethics, are we going to talk deontology, Kantian ethics, utilitarian ethics, cost-benefit analysis? Are we going to talk virtue ethics? Uh, some people talk about the virtues of machine, virtuous machines. Or are we going to talk uh, pragmatist ethics? Why do we need law? Um, we need law to create an incentive structure in a playing field such that actors can act ethically. What we certainly don't want is that a company that wants to act ethically will be pushed out of the market because all the other competitors will say, if I act ethically, others will push, push me out of the market. So we need an incentive structure and nothing more than that. We should not, by law, force people to act the way we want them to act. That's not what law is about. It's about this structure. So in terms of machine learning and fairness, we then look at uh, bias that discriminates on the basis of prohibited legal grounds. It's a very small subset, so it's manageable. Um, uh, that sort of bias is unlawful, and it can result in legal redress, uh, fines, tort liability, uh, compensation, and uh, clauses in contracts can be invalidated, uh, and even legislation might be invalidated because it uh, violates such. Uh, now, where I want to go is profile transparency. So, can we see whether there is bias, what this bias is like, <coughs> and whether it is unfair or um, prohibited? Now, um, we've already talked <laughs> profusely, and I think we're going to go on today to talk about um, explanation and interpretability. I think this is core. We will have to continue to talk about it. And when I think in terms of machine learning, um, I think that if you cannot test something, you cannot contest it. As a lawyer, the explanation has all sorts of reasons why we need explanations, and I think um, Catherine Strandberg has just explained many of these reasons. But I want to move it to this. Law means that you can contest the way you are being treated, or even legislation. Um, and in this case, that means that the profiling or the machine learning that has informed the decision must be testable. That's not the same as interpretable. It's more like saying, okay, uh, you say that that is the outcome, but now put another algorithm on the same training set and then tell me again whether I'm going to be a recidivist. That is so flesh out first the productive bias that ensures the functionality of a system. Figure out the unfairness in the training set, if it's there. Infer discrimination on prohibited grounds. Now the question is, uh, oh yes, uh, there's a wonderful article, I I've, I've, see I have not referenced it, but I should reference it, so I'll send you a new PowerPoint. By um, Belly, I don't remember extremely bad in names, but she wrote a fantastic article in uh, da Big Data and Society on the opacity argument. And she discriminates three types of opacity. She says there's deliberate concealment, so trade secrets, um, IP rights, and for government public security. Excellent reasons from the perspective of these actors to hide the operations of their system. Um, Second, she says, is the argument that, well, you know, we are human beings and we're not wired for understanding statistics, machine learning, or cyber physical uh, infrastructures. It's like that. It's never going to change. This is our biological makeup. I totally disagree with that. If you look at the neuroscientific evidence of what it takes a child, brains, to learn to read and write, that takes years, then you can follow how it changes the morphology <coughs> of the brains, the structure, and the behavior of the brain. So I'm talking about morphology. Yeah? So if we can do that because we value democracy, we want everybody to read and write so that people can contest what is, what is forced upon them in terms of law. 
then it's also possible for statistics. And I don't mean that everybody should be a statistician. Please, God, no. But people must learn to ask, can I see your data set, please? Oh, I can't. Well, <clears throat> then you can't judge me on the basis of that, because I can't contest it, right? Which algorithms did you use? Ah, I have another expert. I don't know about this. I have another expert here. Do you think that's the right algorithm to use in this case? No? OK. Can they put another algorithm? If the stakes are high, this should be possible. And people should, should be able to, to use this vocabulary in a way that makes sense. They shouldn't all just start babbling about training sets, but they should really understand enough to have this conversation. Third point that has been made, uh, I think, excellently by former speakers, and I also think by subsequent speakers, the mismatch, she says, between high dimensional mathematics, computer science, and how we, our semantics, how we talk about meaning. Hmm? Now, I agree that we have a problem there, because, <clears throat> and this is not the same as the second point. Hmm? There are limits to how we can translate between this mathematical stuff and, and how we talk about meaning. So here is a real challenge. And um, this, can be, this can be mitigated or approached, for instance, by means of soft wire verification. I use the term because <clears throat> this is not just about software, but also about hardware, cyber physical uh, strict, uh, infrastructures. So there is mathematical software verification and empirical software verification. And I think it's very important depending on the circumstances, to play with them. Maybe sometimes you can't do the one, but you can do the other. Maybe you can do both of them, not very perfect, but they can complement each other. Uh, and of course, there is the explorative experiment. The speaker has disappeared, but I, I think... Left. Yeah, she, yeah. She, she, she's left. Um, a, a posteriori control. So. I'm thinking of A-B testing, which is, of course, uh, you can do in many different ways. You can also think of participatory technology assessment, which has been around for a long time, citizen juries, uh, participatory social science research. Brian Wynn's already 30-year-old concept of public understanding of science. Andy Sterling's matrix of uncertainty, where he discriminates between uh, uncertainty, ambiguity, ignorance, and um, the fourth one, which I now forgot, um, which, which I think is highly important because he says risk is something you can quantify and the others you cannot quantify. So don't, don't act as if they are quantifiable because then you're making assumptions that are for real life situations which don't work. Um, and I would say we have a, a, needs, a, a need for what uh, Ari Rip, who is a, a, a professor of science and technology studies, and Chantal Mouffe, who is actually a political scientist, call agonistic discourse. So not antagonistic, not like, oh, if you say A, I'm going to say B because I like that. No, agonistic. Put people together from very different perspectives who are serious, who, who feel that it matters. And, when building these systems for real life applications, get them involved. And uh, the more agonistic the debate is, <coughs> the more robust systems you get. Finally, about automated decisions right under the General Data Protection Regulation. I believe that the Data Protection Regulation and also already the <coughs> current directive there has a tool to approach machine learning that is absent in, at this moment, I dare to say, all other legal systems. If I'm not right, I'm going to hear that. Uh, maybe it's trickling through uh, elsewhere. So um, I'm going to hijack the term choice architecture from the, from the nudge people. Uh, choice architecture means you, are, you make yourself aware that how people behave depends on their options, how visible the options are. It also actually depends on nudge theory, so on the idea of cognitive bias. I'm going to use that term and say that machine learning 
especially coupled with the Internet of Things and artificial intelligence, is basically built on the idea that, that it can preempt our intent. Hmm? So it can help us to make a better society, it can help us to better diagnose patients, uh, all sorts of applications that assume that decisions are taken surreptitiously under the radar to a large extent. And honestly, I don't think anybody of us or out there would want to hear about the algorithms and would want to be asked consent all the time. That's not the point. So these systems are running smoothly under the radar of everyday life. They make a whole lot of decisions. And they basically um, present the choice architecture that we live with now. Now, I think that what the GDPR does is opt for a slightly different choice architecture. And um, that is both with regard to data controllers, so the people that are responsible for the, for the machine learning that are using it. But I'm going to focus on the choice architecture for data subjects, so the users of all this wonderful um, technology. And that choice architecture is summarized in three points. So you have the right not to be subject to automated decisions that have a significant impact. I'm abbreviating because otherwise you get so much legal text. That's first. You have a right not to be subject. There are exceptions. You have a right to notification, explanation, and anticipation if one of the exceptions applies. So if it is allowed to uh, do this. And third, you have a right to object against profiling based on the legitimate interest of whoever is employing this. Let's flesh this out a little bit. So the right not to be subject to automated decisions that have a significant impact has three exceptions. First, if it's necessary for concluding a contract or uh, performing a contract. Second, if it's authorized by EU or member state law, think of criminal law and other laws. Third, if there is explicit consent, there is a high threshold <coughs> Uh, for what constitutes uh, legitimate consent. Uh, the person must really understand the consequences and, and some other details. Now, what about these transparency rights? There is a right to notification, explanation, and anticipation. It basically means that if you are making a whole series of automated decisions in your system, think of Smart Grid, for instance, which is going to um, uh, need continuous predictions of everybody's energy usage because otherwise it will be impossible to do load balancing on the web because people are uploading, will be uploading renewables and because if you uh, load your electric car that's about the same as 200 households that would give a power cut on the web unless we have predictive technologies. Okay, so we're going to use that um, what you have to tell people is that you are making these decisions based on profiling. Second, you have to give them a meaningful explanation of the logic involved. And we've talked about that for, um, uh, we are talking about that the whole day, I think. What does it mean? I think it's very good that the legislator, the European legislator, has simply said, this is what we need. If you are going to impact people, you'll have to give reasons for your actions. If that's not possible, sorry, you don't do it. That's a challenge for machine learners, for the people who employ it, for citizens to sit down together and to say, oh my God, but we really want load balancing, otherwise we have power cuts. So this has to become a conversation how to, how to fill this word, meaningful explanation. And I think there are many ways to um, to make that explanation meaningful. And then you also have them to, to tell people the significance and the envisaged consequences of such processing. So you have to explain to them, well, based on uh, these systems, uh, we are going to determine that if four million people are watching a football match, which takes a lot of electricity, television, then you are allowed to use your washing machine, but it will cost you 100 euros because we prefer you not to use your washing machine. Or if you sign a contract, you get a discount on your energy contract. 
but then you give us the right to simply disable your capability to do a washing while everybody is watching the football match. Hmm? And then you have a right to object, etc., etc. So I'm closing off. Individual citizens, because that is my main concern in the end, they need the capability to reinvent themselves, to segregate their data-driven audiences, to have their human dignity respected by data-driven infrastructures, to make sure that machine learning applications do not tell on them beyond what is necessary. And they need the capability to detect and contest bias in their data-driven environments. And that means that the architects of our new data-driven world, that is already here now, I'm not interested in science fiction, uh, need to mind integrity of method, rigorously sound, testable, and thereby contestable methodologies, accountability, that means testability and contestability of both data sets and algorithms, fairness, that means it must be possible to test for bias in the training set and to test for bias in the learning algorithm, and uh, privacy and data protection, well, I've not really talked about that, but this is about how to reduce our manipulability based on these automated decisions. And to, to see data subjects not as the enemy that has to be nudged into giving consent, but as a, a partner, a partner that is going to help to create added value. Um, so uh, that means choice architecture is politics. Law should enable, not force companies to act ethically. This is what Montesquieu actually says in De l'Esprit des Lois. Uh, a good law is a law that allows you to act, enables you to act ethically. There is a need to create a level playing field that puts a threshold in the market. Below that threshold, you'll be liable, you'll pay fines. And to the extent that a company or a government agent cannot give reasons for an automated decision, it must be objectable. People must be able to say, if you don't know why you decided like that about me, sorry, you will have to withdraw that decision. And the minute that is law, oh, I'm sure we'll find all sorts of ways to make it contestable. Um, the difference between law and ethics is also that it's not that a company says, yes, I'm extremely ethically minded. Uh, I, I, I even have this behind my back, don't do evil. But you know how it is. Uh, we're, we're talking competitive advantage here, so I'm sorry, I can't comply today. This is going to mean that the law directs at the level of the board of directors. It's not going to depend on an individual data protection officer. So 4% fines maximum <laughs> of a global turnover. We're not talking about profit, because we know how you can calculate profit. We're talking about global turnover, 4% board level. Furthermore, investigative powers for data protection authorities, and that includes, and it, it's incredible that this got into the regulation, that includes access to any premises, data processing equipment and means. That means that the DPA could go in and actually, if the DPA has the budget and uh, manages to get the experts, uh, some caveats, <laughs> to actually go and check uh, what, what the biases are <coughs> and whether they are complying with the um, directive. Okay, this is the end. <laughs> I think that we have time for a few uh, questions, maybe two. Uh, okay, so Michael and then after. Okay. Okay. You, in the report you were involved in about big data and safety, you recommended semi automated decision making to be regulated. Um, and here, uh, you could put, it, while this may work for the behavior environment, it, in, you could put humans in the loop in this situation, pressing buttons. Uh, do you think that the GDPR can deal with <coughs> gaming of the automated decision making? 
I think that's a very good question. In the, the last draft of the GDPR, which was formulated by the uh, European Parliament, it said um, uh, something like automated or semi-automated decisions. But uh, of course, the, the, regu the regulation is a compromise, and that got thrown out. So it says, uh, based solely on automated uh, means, um, I think that's very problematic, but because this is law and not computer code, mm -hmm. I think that courts, uh, and, and we have to depend then on the court in Luxembourg, is going to open that term and say, well, yes, I can see that there is somebody pushing a button, but uh, th if that person always takes the same decision, or nearly always, as the decision system, then we are going to understand that as uh, automatically taken decisions. So uh, the jury is out on that, but I, I, uh, I think that will happen. Okay, so Arsene, 